Did You Know? A few weeks before Jet Set Radio's North American release as Jet Grind Radio, Sega hosted a contest in San Francisco called Graffiti is Art. The contest aimed to promote graffiti as art rather than vandalism. Willie Brown, mayor of San Francisco at the time, attempted to shut the event down by revoking Sega's permits. Unfortunately for them, Sega of America had acquired all of its permits to host the competition through entirely legal methods, and it went off without a hitch, receiving over 130 entries. While Jet Set Radio's gameplay primarily involved skating, graffiti was an integral part of it from the beginning. Masayoshi Kikuchi, the project lead on Jet Set Radio, and art director Ryuta Ueda's previous project was Panzer Dragoon Saga for the Sega Saturn. After coming off such a hardcore fantasy title, Kikuchi said the team wanted to work on something completely unlike Panzer Dragoon, something dealing with pop culture. Ueda's initial concept art for Jet Set Radio led to the idea of a punky street kid wearing headphones rollerblading between people in a crowded town. From there, the team was inspired by the anti-establishment themes of the movie Fight Club. Jet Set Radio's graffiti tagging mechanic was a natural product of combining anti-establishment, the streets, and pop culture. Once the design was settled on, Jet Set Radio saw completion after only 10 months of development with a team of less than 25 people. Jet Set Radio takes place in Tokyo To, a vibrant interpretation of Tokyo, Japan. This was done so that the game's world was immediately recognizable and welcoming to a Japanese audience. Worried about how this would be received by Western audiences, Sega made some changes when localizing the game. The versions sent to North America and Europe featured two extra levels, Phantom Street and Grind Square, inspired by New York City and Times Square respectively. Phantom Street features a central street below an elevated rail system, a blacktop park, and several tightly packed tall buildings. While the level takes place during the day, its design, as well as its name being an anagram of Batman, hints that the level was based on Gotham City. In fact, there's an image of an unused poster hidden in the game's code featuring three shadowy characters and the words, Dark Man Returns. But perhaps due to a copyright for a game called Dark Man already existing, the poster was modified. Lastly, the game also features a few tracks specific for the North American and PAL regions, such as the remix of Rob Zombie's Dragula, featured on Phantom Street. While the game's composer, Hideki Naganuma, composed most of the game's varied soundtrack, he also found various artists throughout Japan to contribute. Underground J-Rock group Guitar Vader contributed the songs Magical Girl and Super Brothers. Super Brothers appears to be a parody of the Super Mario Bros, as suggested by a part of the lyrics which follows... At the time, Sega and Nintendo were fierce competitors, making this a strange reference to Frame. However, since the song predates Jet Set Radio, it's unclear whether or not Naganuma chose the song for that reason, or was even aware of it. That's not it for soundtrack easter eggs either. In one of Naganuma's tracks titled Let Mom Sleep, a sample of the phrase, Will you stop playing that radio of yours? I'm trying to get to sleep, can be heard from an old British sitcom called Hancock's Half Hour. I'm trying to get to sleep. There are a couple fine touches that were made to Jet Set Radio's characters during development. Throughout the game, you'll receive messages from DJ Professor K, the DJ of the eponymous pirate radio station Jet Set Radio. There are unused designs still in the game's code that show the characters without their wrist gadgets, suggesting that the station was a late addition to the game's design. In the character Beats' early texture files, his shirt says Ereki, short for electricity, and featured a lightning bolt and light bulb logo instead of what exists today. Beat was also featured on the European pre-release box art of Jet Set Radio with six fingers on one of his hands, though this was fixed in subsequent official art. Despite being a much larger and more detailed game, Jet Set Radio Future took roughly the same amount of time to create and featured most of the same team members. The game was a launch title for the Xbox in Japan, a decision which appeared strange considering it was competing with Japanese consoles. Kikuchi chose to develop Future for the Xbox because the US market appeared to be more accepting of Jet Grind Radio than Japan was of Jet Set Radio. Jet Set Radio Future was created as a restructuring of the original instead of a sequel, as the developers didn't want to feel restricted by the previous game. Among a myriad of gameplay changes, the game's main miniboss, Captain Onishima, is replaced by Commander Hayashi. Though the characters are quite similar, there appears to be a weapon swap for Hayashi's in-game model which would replace his revolver with a katana. However, he is never actually shown wielding the sword.
Jetset Radio Future also pushed the amount of fake in-game branding with more flyers, in-game objects, and billboards, one of which hides a possible reference to Prince of Tennis. This billboard features a tennis player with dark blue sleeves and shorts and a white hat, closely resembling the outfits featured in Prince of Tennis. The billboard also says Contrail. This could thus be a reference to a musical single of the same name made by Chotaro Otori, a Prince of Tennis character who composes music in his spare time. There are a number of hidden easter eggs and odd occurrences in Jet Set Radio Future. Hidden in the GG's garage is this upright, old-style bullet train. It's unclear why this exists as it's hidden away in the game's level design, but if you observe the window at the top of the train, you'll see what appears to be a joke on the behalf of an artist. Kibokaoka Hill is a messy, crowded residential district. There are a large number of stray cats strewn throughout the level, including a small room hidden amongst the buildings filled with cats. Suspiciously, Kibokaoka Hill is also the level where you can unlock Potts, the GG's dog, as a playable character. Many of the levels in Jet Set Radio Future are inspired by and named after real places in Japan, despite not being direct recreations. Dokenzaka Hill, the first major level in the game, refers to a neighborhood in Shibuya, Tokyo, named after an Edo period bandit who renounced his ways and became a Buddhist monk. Perhaps more famously, it features a large number of antique stores and love hotels, which are short-stay hotels for couples seeking some additional amenities and privacy. Chuo Street refers to the main thoroughfare in Akihabara, a part of Japan famous for its shopping and classic gaming arcades, from which a massive Sega building is clearly visible. There hasn't been a new Jet Set Radio game since Jet Set Radio Future, but in 2006, Kuchu Entertainment created and proposed a concept for a new entry in the series to Sega. The untitled successor was planned for the Wii and would have brought back Beat, Gum, Tab, DJ Professor K, Poison Jam, and featured a new game called the Squabble Hawks. However, Sega was not interested in the concept, and thus the game never came to be. Since the development team behind Jet Set Radio was reabsorbed into Sega in 2004, Kikuchi and Ueda have done major work together on the Yakuza franchise. Instead of joining them, Naganuma left Sega to pursue his own prospects, the latest of which include music for an upcoming game called Hover Revolt of Gamers, an open-world skating game largely inspired by Jet Set Radio. Did you know? Super Monkey Ball started out as one of Sega's Naomi Arcade Cabinets, simply titled Monkey Ball. It contained all of the main stages found in Super Monkey Ball, but it lacked multiplayer and the playable character Gon Gon. It only had one master stage and utilized a banana-shaped joystick. The concept for the game was created by Amusement Vision, a branch of Sega led by studio head Toshihiro Nagoshi. Nagoshi wanted to move away from realistic simulators and develop a game that players could instantly understand. To achieve this, Nagoshi created a physics-based prototype that focused on rolling a ball through mazes. However, the game was quickly found to be visually unappealing, and the developers found it difficult to express the motion of the ball on a solid color round model. They even tried putting textures on the ball, but it didn't solve the problem. On a whim, Nagoshi put a monkey model previously designed by an unnamed female employee inside the ball. The entire team found it cute and appealing, and the concept stuck. After the addition of collectible bananas and some distinctive ears on the monkey, the physics prototype debuted as the 2001 arcade game Monkey Ball. The GameCube revamp of Monkey Ball Super Monkey Ball was notable for bettering the relationship between rivals Sega and Nintendo. Sega's Naomi arcade cabinets shared the same hardware architecture as the Dreamcast, making it easier to port games to the console. Monkey Ball was originally going to be ported to the Dreamcast, but this became impractical as the console was scheduled to be discontinued. Instead, Amusement Vision chose to release the game on the Nintendo GameCube, which they found easy to develop for. Nagoshi liked the features of the GameCube, and even joked out of the GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox, Nintendo's console was the only one he didn't hate. When asked why Super Monkey Ball was imported to all six generation consoles, Nagoshi said, From the developer's side, every hardware piece is very different, even though we use them to program similar video games. Last autumn, everyone was talking about what hardware is better to develop for, but in my point of view, GameCube seemed the most fun and interesting to develop games for. Additionally, from my point of view, I think the GameCube hardware will allow us to easily port our arcade titles. There was actually a third main series Super Monkey Ball game planned to be released on the GameCube, called Super Monkey Ball 3 Banana crazy. It was announced at E3 2003 and planned to be released the following year. The game was rumored to have LAN mode capable of supporting up to 8 players. Why Super Monkey Ball 3 was cancelled is unknown. The franchise's fame
famous for its product placement, with several games having real-world brands featured in them. In the original Monkey Ball, Super Monkey Ball 1, and Super Monkey Ball 2, Sega partnered with Dole to cover many of the game's models with their logo. This branding was removed in future games such as Super Monkey Ball Deluxe. The branding on the series Bananas was eventually replaced by a new company logo, Chiquita. Sega's affiliation with Chiquita was actually part of a larger deal. Along with the game's release, over 180 million Chiquita Bananas featured special stickers promoting the game. The two companies also held a Super Bonanza sweepstakes, where a family could win a 50-inch TV, a Wii, the Wii Balance Board with Wii Fit Plus, and a copy of Super Monkey Ball Step and Roll. The main characters from the Super Monkey Ball series are arguably Ai Ai, Mimi, and Baby. Rather than being simply alternate characters, Sega revealed that they are actually family members. It's not known for sure where Ai Ai got his name. He does, however, share his name with a robot monkey in the Japanese version of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which is called Coconuts in the English game. The series has other secrets. In Super Monkey Ball 2's beginner stage, Bumpy, there are small bumps throughout the stage that serve as obstacles. From above, the bumps are revealed to be Braille and read, Hi, this is Jamad. That's right, Braille alphabet. I respect you. Jamad is most likely the nickname of Junichi Yamada, the game's stage design director. This isn't the only secret hidden in Super Monkey Ball 2's stages. In 1975, computer graphics researcher Martin Newell of the University of Utah created a mathematical model of his wife's teapot. His model became known as the the Utah Teapot, and is used extensively to test lighting and geometry in 3D scenes. The advanced extra stage in Super Monkey Ball 2 named Teapot is based on Newell's model. Another hidden detail relates to Super Monkey Ball 2's villain, Dr. Bad Boon. In the cutscenes for the game, the doctor seems to speak in gibberish. If each word in the audio is individually reversed, it becomes clear that he's speaking the actual lines in English, only backwards and slightly distorted. <laughs> Even the manual for Super Monkey Ball holds an Easter egg. On the upper corners of the manual for Super Monkey Ball 1, a small image of Ai Ai can be seen. If the manual is quickly flicked through, it is revealed to be a flip book. Super Monkey Ball has been a major success for Sega. References to the series can be found everywhere, including other games. The World of Warcraft Super Simeon Sphere Trinket is an obvious reference to Super Monkey Ball. Upon using the trinket's ability, the player is transformed into a gorilla and surrounded by a purple ball for five minutes. Hyperdimension Neptunia also has a reference to Super Monkey Ball. The in-game monkey bracelet description reads, a cute bracelet with a monkey trapped inside a clear ball. Rumors say making it take part in races is a popular gambling sport on Loi. Other games paying tribute isn't the only example of Super Monkey Ball's impact. The games were also used to test the efficiency of surgical doctors. Florida Hospital Celebration Health conducted a series of experiments where over 300 physicians played Super Monkey Ball 2 before performing simulated laparoscopic surgery. Dr. James Rosser, the general surgeon behind the research project, found that surgeons who warmed up to the game were more efficient and were able to suppress errors. Additionally, he discovered that surgeons who played video games in the past for more than three hours per week made 37% fewer errors were 27% faster and scored 26% better overall than surgeons who had never played video games. Did you know? Rumors began circulating about a successor to the struggling Sega Saturn as early as 1995, less than a year after the Saturn's release. Lockheed Martin, who had worked with Sega on arcade boards, was said to be working on a more powerful version of the Saturn. They allegedly submitted a number of designs over the next few years, but Sega became impatient and decided to design a new system themselves. Nvidia also approached Sega, hoping to work on their new console. Their first video card, the NV1, was based on Saturn hardware. While it was powerful, it was unorthodox and difficult to develop games with. Sega gave Nvidia a chance, demanding they produce a working prototype of their hardware. When Nvidia's Saturn V08 chip returned a blank screen during the presentation, Sega dropped them on the spot. Sega's next strategy was an unconventional risk. They approached both the Japanese company Videologic and the American-based 3DFX and hired them to develop new hardware. Their projects were codenamed White Belt and Black Belt respectively, as they were intended to deliver the knockout blow that Sega needed. The two teams were effectively in competition with one another, although neither of them knew it. The Japanese team was led by Hideki Sato, who had designed the Genesis. Their project White Belt was later renamed Dural, after the Virtua Fighter character. Its final codename was Katana.
manner. The White Belt team used Videologic's Power VR2 GPU, which was an appealing solution due to its high performance at low cost. Additionally, NEC, the company manufacturing the chip, were Japanese. Meanwhile, 3DFX were working on their version of the hardware, codenamed Black Belt. Sega partnered with Microsoft, who designed the console's OS, or operating system. Because of this partnership, the Black Belt was easy to program for, which corrected one of the Saturn's biggest flaws. The reception to this deal was positive, with many expressing relief that Sega were towing the industry line with their new console. However, success bred its own problems. 3DFX received a lot of positive attention for their powerful graphics chips, and the company soon decided to go public. They released an IPO, an intent of public offering, to let the public buy stocks in their company. To comply with US law, they had to disclose the details of their work with Sega, including details of Sega's new secret project. Sega would eventually choose to go with Videologic's design over 3DFX's, a decision that caused some members of Sega of America to quit in protest. Some speculate that 3DFX going public created friction between the two companies, although the ex-president of Sega America, Bernie Stolar, denies this. In retrospect, he felt that Sega should have gone with the 3DFX hardware, but he explained, Japan wanted the Japanese version and Japan won. 3DFX losing the Sega project caused the stock to plummet by 43%. They filed a lawsuit against Sega claiming that they had been misled. They accused Sega of improper conduct for secretly pitting 3DFX and Videologic against one another, resulting in a lawsuit which was settled out of court. Electronic Arts, who were historically Sega's allies, chose not to support the Dreamcast. Though EA owned stock in 3DFX, ex-Vice President Bing Gordon denied that the lawsuit affected relationships between Sega and EA. However, he admitted that the decision to choose Videologic confused him. He said, If Sega had picked the direct competitor to 3DFX at the time, it would have been fine. But they picked someone we had never heard of. It was somebody's friend of somebody's friend at a Japanese country club. According to Gordon, EA distanced themselves from the console for a number of reasons. Developers had little enthusiasm for the Videologic chipset. Sega were indecisive about including a modem, and Sega's financial situation meant that they couldn't afford to give EA the discounted licensing deal that they'd grown used to. Ex-president of Sega America, Bernie Stolar, had a different account of EA and Sega's relationship. He claims that EA demanded exclusivity on sports games in exchange for their support. However, Sega had just purchased visual concepts for $10 million, and their sports games were a key part of Sega's Dreamcast strategy. Stolar offered EA third-party exclusivity, and later, Sega Japan would try to entice the company with lower royalties. EA, however, stuck to their decision and turned their back on the Dreamcast. Sega had a much stronger relationship with Microsoft. After their work on the Black Belt's OS fell through, Microsoft again approached the company, offering to port Windows CE to the console as an optional OS. Windows CE was widely considered to be less versatile than the native OS, but Stolar was convinced Microsoft had ulterior motives, saying, they got to learn the business and then walk away. The branding company Interbrand went through 5,000 potential names for the console. They eventually settled on Dreamcast, a portmanteau of Dream and Broadcast. Despite all of its problems, it looked like the Dreamcast was going to be the hit that Sega needed. The Dreamcast's American launch on September 9th, 1999 was huge. The console sold a record 225,132 units in its first day, and cleared 1 million units in 11 weeks. But this winning streak was short-lived. Sony unveiled the PlayStation 2 in March 1999, during the Dreamcast's Japanese launch window. Lingering doubts about Sega carried over from their failed consoles, which led many to see the PlayStation 2 as a much safer purchase. Though Sega claimed it was to promote the launch of their Sega Net service, the Dreamcast price was lowered to $149 in the face of this fierce competition. Sega intended to rely on software sales to make a profit. Unfortunately for Sega, it was very easy to play pirated games on the Dreamcast. The console used Sega's proprietary GD-ROM discs, which had three tracks. The first contained text files with licensing information, and the second contained an audio track that warned the user not to insert it into a CD player. The last track was the game itself. To prevent piracy, the table of contents on the disc only mentioned the first two tracks, so the final track would be skipped if inserted into a PC. To dump the game's data for copying, all the pirate had to do was swap the discs without the computer knowing, thus skipping the table of contents. 
Records. While the Dreamcast would check for authenticity while reading the disc, hackers found an easy workaround by using the console's MILCD feature. MILCD, or Music Interactive Live CD, was another proprietary format intended to add multimedia capabilities to music CDs. This basically meant that MILCD added features such as enhanced menus, internet capabilities, and video to music albums and singles. The format was unsuccessful as no major music labels were willing to back it, resulting in just eight discs being released in Japan. However, pirates could trick the console into booting illegally copied discs by posing them as MILCDs instead of GD-ROMs. Later versions of the Dreamcast had the MILCD feature disabled to prevent this, but by then it was too late. In September of 2000, Sega of America executives Peter Moore and Belfield came to the conclusion that the company had to withdraw from the console market. The duo prepared a Manifesto of the Future, which they presented to Sega's Japanese higher-ups in a meeting that same month. Though Microsoft had not yet announced the Xbox, Moore and Belfield were aware of their intentions to enter the gaming industry as other Sega executives had speculated. However, this meeting was the first time that Sega's Japanese leadership were told of the impending competition from Microsoft. When Moore and Belfield told them that the Dreamcast had to be discontinued, the Japanese executives walked out of the meeting, a very rude gesture in Japan. However, some ex-Sega staff, such as founder David Rosen, thought that the company ought to have withdrawn drawn from the hardware race a lot sooner. In an interview with Next Generation magazine, he said, I've always felt that it was a bit of a folly for them to be limiting their potential to Sega hardware. Sega announced that they would be restructuring to become a platform agnostic third-party publisher in January of 2001. The Dreamcast was dropped to $99.95 on February 4th to expedite Sega's departure from the hardware business, and was formally discontinued on March 31st. The console had dropped further to a mere $49 by the end of 2001 as Sega tried to clear their stock. Sega's chairman, Iseo Okawa, approached Bill Gates numerous times to ask if it was possible to make the Xbox backwards compatible with the Dreamcast, allowing Sega fans to migrate to a new console. While these negotiations fell through, Sega maintained a close relationship with Microsoft, signing an 11-game deal for the Xbox. Okawa returned his stock in Sega to the company and donated 85 billion yen, roughly $737 million at the time, to keep Sega afloat. He passed away soon thereafter of a heart failure in March 2001. Before it was discontinued, Sega tried to keep the Dreamcast afloat in other ways. Sega stated that they would talk about DVD playback in early 2000, hoping to mitigate backlash from the announcement that the PS2 would play DVDs out of the box. At E3 2000, Sega showed off the Dreamcast DVD player. However, Sega never addressed the DVD player after this, and many in the industry speculated that the DVD player was simply an empty plastic shell. Sega also planned to release a VMU MP3 player that could hold over an hour of 128 kilobytes per second MP3 music. Sega had apparently partnered with the online store mp3.com, but the device never came to fruition. Did you know? Decisions made by Sega for the Saturn actually helped both of Sega's competitors. When the Saturn was being developed, Sega of America president Tom Kalinske was concerned about the system specs. And during this time, two different companies offered to work with Sega to resolve their concerns. These were Silicon Graphics Incorporated, aka SGI, and Sony. Kalinske met with SGI founder Jim Clark, who pitched their new energy-efficient chips. Kalinsky then presented these chips to Sega of Japan, who declined based on the cost and size of the chips. Although no deal was made, Kalinsky appreciated the work SGI had done, and suggested to Clark that he approach Nintendo with the chips. Nintendo ended up accepting SGI's offer, which helped them to create the Nintendo 64. When Sony approached Sega, they proposed a collaboration on a disc-based console. The two companies had a shared enemy in Nintendo, as Nintendo had spurned Sony by abruptly cancelling a deal for Sony to make a disc peripheral for the Super Nintendo. Sony's Ken Kutaragi and Sega's Tom Kalinske were enthusiastic about the team-up, but president of Sega Enterprises Hayao Nakayama was unimpressed. He declined the deal due to Sony's inexperience in the console market. Afterwards, Sony decided to enter the console race independently with the PlayStation. Sony also poached many of Sega's top staff, such as Kalinsky's right-hand man, Steve Race, who would offer them valuable insights into Sega's strategies. 
If this wasn't bad enough, Kalinske was right to be anxious about the Saturn. Sega thought they'd have the late 1994 launch window all to themselves, but in November 1993, Sony announced they'd be launching the PlayStation around the same time. News of the PlayStation's impressive 3D graphics allegedly terrified Sega, and led to Nakayama demanding a second CPU to be added to the Saturn. This second CPU would be to boost the console's 2D and 3D capabilities so that it could compete with Sony. Such a huge upset so late in production led to doubts about the system making its launch date. Not only this, but the dual processors made the Saturn difficult to develop for. At the time, Sega had two consoles in development, one codenamed Jupiter and one codenamed Saturn. Jupiter was intended to be a cartridge-based alternative to the Saturn that shared many of the same specifications, but it was dropped to make way for yet another console project. A group of Sega employees attending CES in January 1994 were invited to a conference call with Nakayama. He demanded an immediate response to Atari's Jaguar, instructing the team to create an upgrade for the Genesis. The decision seemed to make sense, as delays looked likely for the Saturn, and the Genesis was still performing well in America. This upgrade would come to be known as Mars, and would eventually be released as the Sega 32X. In practice, however, the 32X only ended up hampering the Saturn's launch. The two consoles shared a lot of hardware, including their Hitachi SH2 processors. This led to shortages, with many of the chips intended for the 32X being used instead for the production of more Saturn consoles. Another problem was the launch window for the two consoles. The 32X launched in November 1994 in the West, the same month that the Saturn launched in Japan. This eroded goodwill towards Sega, with consumers wondering why they should buy the 32X when the Saturn's launch was imminent. In the words of ex-Sega employee Scott Bayless, it made us look greedy and dumb to consumers. The move also confused developers, who had to choose between developing for the peripheral or for the Saturn. The US release of the Saturn was intended to be on Saturday, September 2nd, 1995, dubbed Saturn Day by Sega. However, they ended up launching much, much earlier, announcing a surprise release on May 11, the first day of E3. The Saturn had been performing well in Japan since its release in November 1994. Its advantages were clear, it had a roster of strong titles, with Virtua Fighter in particular being the most popular arcade game in Japan. It had also launched ahead of the PlayStation. Nakayama hoped to recreate the same ingredients for success in America, and instructed Kalinske to announce the console's launch date. Kalinske opposed the decision, but was told he had no choice in the matter, so the announcement was made. Releasing the console so early gave magazines and retailers no time to publicize the launch, making it hard to advertise. Sega also had to choose only a few retailers to receive the console at first because of limited stock, which upset some of the other retailers. KB Toys in particular refused to stock the system in response. Many attribute the Saturn's poor performance to its lack of mainline Sonic platformer, such as the cancelled Sonic Extreme. The game had a tumultuous development. The project started at Sega Technical Institute as a side-scroller for the Genesis, but it was soon moved to the 32X under the working title Sonic Mars. When the 32X flopped, the team were told to shift their focus to the Saturn. The pressure was immense, and the team chewed through many members. They split into two groups, one to create the game's engine and levels on PC, and the other, known as Team Condor, to port the game directly onto the Saturn. The team quickly encountered issues with the 3D perspective, and to combat these issues, they employed a unique fisheye camera that would warp the playfield over a sphere, giving a greater field of view. Unfortunately, Nakayama was so displeased with their efforts that he took one look at the game before storming out of the building. He instructed them to rebuild the game around the boss engine, the only part he liked. Sega wanted the game to be released in Christmas 1996. To help meet this deadline, the team requested to use the engine and dev tools for Nights Into Dreams programmed by Yuji Naka. Permission was granted, and they began to familiarize themselves with the technology, but this precious time was ultimately wasted. Yuji Naka had not been consulted about the decision, and was furious when he found out. Fueled by the rivalry between Sega of Japan and America, he threatened to quit if they continued using the engine. Despite all this scrambling, the team were miraculously able to find a foothold. Despite this, Sonic Extreme was officially cancelled almost as soon as they solidified their level creation tool. 
Designer Christian Sen believed that with the asset and work and creation tools, he and programmer Ofa Alon could have finished the game by themselves in 6 to 12 weeks. The Saturn version of the game was handled by Chris Coffin, who was so dedicated to finishing the project that he cancelled his lease and moved his belongings into the office. Coffin almost drove himself into the ground, catching pneumonia as a result of his intense work schedule. To make up for the lack of Sonic, Sega tried out other mascots to fill the spot. This included real-time associate Bug, where a Hollywood acting insect accepts a film in which his girlfriend is kidnapped. Bug received generally positive reviews, but was heavily criticized for bringing nothing new to the genre, and attempted to copy Sonic's bad boy persona. The game was even praised by film director Steven Spielberg, who claimed, This is the character that is going to do it for the Saturn. A Bug 2 was also released, but to far less favorable reviews and sales. Kalinsky's disagreements with Sega Japan's policies also led to his departure in 1996. He was replaced by ex-Sony employee Bernie Stolar, who took a controversial stance on the Saturn. He infamously declared at E3 1997 that Saturn is not our future, and decided to reinforce quality over quantity. This meant holding back the localization of many Japanese games, particularly ones that were less likely to succeed in the Western market. The Saturn went through a number of models. A white model was released in Japan in 1996. The new color scheme, as well as the lowered price point, was intended to make the console appeal to women and children. Another unreleased Saturn model was discovered in 2013, codenamed Pluto. The console was posted on the Assembler Games forums by a user claiming to have worked at Sega. The Pluto included a built-in Netlink modem for online play. In today's episode, we'll be exploring more trivia from one of Sega's most beloved consoles, the Sega Genesis, also known as the Mega Drive. We all know that Sega's success was helped in no small part by the creation of their iconic mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. However, one iconic character from the series wasn't initially planned. After the first game on the console became a smash hit, Sega unsurprisingly requested a sequel from the original team. One of the fundamental elements that developer Yuji Naka wanted to be included was some form of multiplayer. Originally conceived as a competitive racing mode, it eventually evolved into what they referred to as a 1.5 player co-op mode too. For this addition, the team needed to come up with a new character, eventually resulting in the creation of Tails' Miles Prower. However, to begin with, this character was not a fox but a tanuki, otherwise known as a Japanese raccoon dog. The initial designs were based on a UFO catcher plush doll, but the design was too clumsy. The decision to change the second character's species was made due to Nintendo having close ties to the tanuki at the time, with tanukis appearing in Super Mario Bros. 3 as a power-up for Mario. To give this fox character more personality, a second tail was added. Making a character for any game can take time, and while most companies follow standard practices when including characters they don't own the rights to, this isn't always the case. This process can sometimes be overlooked, causing problems for companies. Sega referenced characters from other media in their initial release of Revenge of Shinobi, with one boss fight featuring Spider-Man, who, after enough damage, would transform into Batman. The boss fight is implied to be against a ninja capable of shape-shifting, not the actual characters. After this initial publication of the game, a revision was made and released again as version 1.01, .01, this time altering the appearance of Batman into a demon with wings, with a close resemblance to the titular character from the manga series Devilman. This wouldn't be the only revision made, however. Revision 1.02 changed Spider-Man's appearance to more closely resemble the character, and included a copyright notice for Marvel Entertainment after Sega obtained a license to the character for other titles on the console. This change also altered the fight so that, upon being defeated, Spider-Man wouldn't shapeshift. He would flee instead implying he was the actual character and no longer a shapeshifter. After the license for the character expired, another version was made for the Wii Virtual Console. This version changed Spider-Man to have a pink costume instead, making him a totally different and unique character. 
This 1.04 version is now used for all re-releases of the title. The reason for Spider-Man's original appearance in the game was explained by Nori Yoshioba, who said, Sega had already acquired copyright permission for the Spider-Man arcade game they were developing. We were actually asked by Sega to include Spider-Man as part of the promotional effort for that game. In that case, we were actually told to make him look more like Spider-Man. Other characters were also altered in these subsequent versions. In the game's initial release, enemies with flamethrowers were named Rocky in the Japanese manual, and took on the appearance of Rambo, two characters portrayed by Sylvester Stallone. After the first update, their design was changed to feature sunglasses and male pattern baldness. The boss of Round 7 was also changed, with the original release being a representation of Godzilla until it was changed in Revision 3 to simply remove his skin. Speaking of legal changes, one title released by Sega had the license changed after creative differences between then-Sega studio Camelot and Climax Entertainment. Landstalker, the treasures of King Knoll, wasn't initially created as a new property, and was actually intended to be the third entry in the Shining Force franchise, before Shining Force 2 under the name Shining Rogue. Fans of Shining Force have noted that many references to Shining Force can be found throughout the Landstalker series, such as Yogurt's Ring making an appearance in the Dreamcast sequel, Time Stalkers. Going back to Landstalker, there's actually a scene which was cut from international releases. At one point in the game, it's possible to stumble across Kayla enjoying a nice, relaxing bath, before she offers Nigel the opportunity to join her. Though given the option to say yes, Friday will prevent the player from doing so. While this scene was cut during localization, the scene was still translated in the game's code, but was impossible to encounter due to a maid being placed in the bathroom's doorway. By removing the character in the game's code, or by way of a cheat device, it's possible to still gain access and sneak a quick peek. Sound effects are another important part of any good title, though their creation and implementation are often overlooked. With Sega's Golden Axe, it appears that those in charge of creating the death sounds took inspiration from classic 1980s action films. In the Mega Drive version, one of the death cries is actually just a digitized version of a scream from Conan the Barbarian. It wouldn't just be first-party Sega games found to be lifting content from strange places. Metal Fangs, by Victor Musical Industries, was released exclusively in Japan, following a group of cyberpunk-style races. Hardcore Gaming 101 has uncovered a major inspiration for many of the game's characters, the music industry. Many portraits were simply traced from photos of iconic musicians, and given the cybernetic treatment. Some of these may be speculation, but the websites suggest the images include Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols, Madonna, David Bowie, Angus Young of ACDC, MC Hammer, Robert Smith from The Cure, Morrissey, and Adam Horowitz from The Beastie Boys. Another game on the system with an interesting musical reference, amongst other things, is Contra Hardcore. This music reference appears in a secret ending found during Stage 3, after talking to a man on top of a climbable wall. The man offers the player a chance to participate within the battle arena, where the player will enjoy a remix of Vampire Killer from Konami's other series, Castlevania. Here, three bosses must be defeated. They include a disco robot who, after being defeated, will explode into fish pastries, a robot zombie dinosaur pushing a carriage holding a machine gun with a large slime monster inside, and a robot brain which can warp around the room. After defeating these bosses, the player is sucked into a magical portal and sent back in time to the Age of Dinosaurs. Several years after, the player finds themselves as the King of Monkeys, before the game's credits roll. Another Mega Drive game which makes reference to another game on the system is Ranger X. In the game's Japanese release, there's a secret easy difficulty mode that can be unlocked by going to the options screen and inputting ABC, ABC, ABC. Not only does the whole game become significantly easier, but an additional stage is added prior to level 1, which differs from the title's usual dark and moody tones to a more light-hearted parody of several Sega titles like Alex Kidd and Sonic the Hedgehog. 
Another interesting, and slightly bizarre cheat, comes from the Genesis release of ESPN National Hockey Night. The game contains a cheat that strips the game down to a one-on-one -on -one game of Pong. This can be done by entering B, C, 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 up, down on the main menu. However, the original aesthetic of the classic Pong isn't present. The puck does remain the same, but the paddles have been replaced by two hockey players. If this still resembles Pong just a little bit too much, the player can enter an additional code on the main menu. A, C, B, up, right, and up, to replace the puck with an octopus, for some reason. Fantasy Star 2, the sequel to the Master System classic, has an interesting regional difference. Ustvestia, a piano teacher found in the northwest outskirts of Oputa, will play music for the party, acting as a sound test board so players can listen to the game's soundtrack. He's also capable of teaching the music technique to anyone in the party. In the game's English version, if a male party member wants to learn the skill, Ustvestia will state he looks smart and gives the character a reduced fee of 2,000 compared to the 5,000 he charges for female characters. The Japanese version of the game reveals the reason for this gender disparity. Ustvestia will instead state he looks cute and is openly homosexual. This was altered for the game's English release, possibly to avoid contention from players who find the image of two men having steamy passionate coitus uncomfortable. Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll be exploring trivia from games on Sega's last foray into the world of consoles, the much-loved Dreamcast. Sega was in a tough situation with the Dreamcast. Their competition was about to ramp up the console race into top gear, with consoles from Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft on the horizon. This was partly brought upon themselves, as Sega inspired Sony to work extensively on 3D gaming. We'll start by dipping into one of the most recognizable and defining games on the system, Shenmue. When the game was released, the package contained four discs three for the actual Shenmue game, and an additional disc called the Shenmue Passport. This piece of software acted as a sort of interface to connect to the internet. Users could download information regarding the game, or upload their best scores from Shenmue's various minigames. The system also allowed players to download character biographies, with 3D models which could be examined. By looking closely at the character of Siu Ying, or more specifically, her eyes, a texture used for a reflection can be seen. On close examination and through camera trickery, it's possible to see the image of a real photograph of a person, likely used to show the reflection of an indistinct face. It's unknown who this is a photograph of, however. Another texture-related oddity is on the back of Siu Ying's head, where her face can be found hidden underneath her hair. The Shenmue passport was eventually discontinued, with Sega no longer updating their servers. That is, until one day in 2006, seven years after its release, a new update message was posted. The message read, 22.02.2006, the Shenmue passport is in update process. Come again and visit us. This led many to believe that Shenmue would be receiving additional content, or even a sequel. However, after trying to upload their scores for the forklift racing minigame, it appeared this part of the passport was inoperable. This was because someone had actually got a hold of the Shenmue.com domain address, and had decided to play a prank on unsuspecting players. The user, known online as Sakura Gaoka, had uploaded a number of files which could be used to download content for the Shenmue passport but also wanted to inspire hope to players that a third entry in the Shenmue series was being planned and created. Many people online became furious, as Sakura Gaoka had lied to fans of the series. To their credit, they had at least made then-expired content available for download once again. In an attempt to calm the situation, Sakura Gaoka posted a message on the Shenmue Dojo message boards. I want to say sorry again to all. If anyone has reached to a Sega person, tell him to contact me, and I'll transfer the domain as the people of this forum told me. Sorry again. Don't lose the hope in Shenmue. Sega Intellectual Property Department staffer Takemi Suzuki responded to these issues in an email to Sakura Gaoka, saying, My name is Suzuki and I am handling domain name issues at Sega Corporation. We very much appreciate your kind offer to return the domain name Shenmue.com to Sega. Our company had no intention of abandoning the website Shenmue.com, and we would like to proceed with transfer of the domain name shortly, 
in the hope that you will understand and agree to the transfer. Thank you again for your support for our games, and wish you all the very best. While this prank resulted in no real damage being done, one game published for the Dreamcast posed a very serious risk to consumers. In November 2001, the Atelier compilation title, Atelier Marie and Ellie, The Alchemists of Salberg Episodes 1 and 2, was released for the Sega Dreamcast exclusively in Japan. In this release, fans were treated to a small sampling of extra content if they inserted the game's disc into their Windows PC disk drive, including specially created screensavers. Unbeknownst to not just players, but also Sega and the game's developer Cool Kiz, there were major problems with the screensavers. Although the Dreamcast would be left unaffected by playing the game, when booting the bonus screensavers in a Windows environment, the computer would become infected with an incredibly damaging virus known as Kriz. The Kriz virus would delete the user's CMOS settings, and modify the Windows install's kernel32.dll file in a way that would prevent it from being repaired. The virus would remain dormant on a system until Christmas Day, December 25th, rolled around. Should the user boot their system on Christmas Day, the virus would execute its payload, overwriting any file it finds on all attached storage devices hard drives, floppy drives, network drives, it was ruthless. After replacing all available files with garbage data, the virus then attempts to flash the system's BIOS, effectively rendering the computer's motherboard useless until repaired. In response to this virus being discovered by the game's developers, CoolKiz alerted users to the possible dangers of inserting the disk into their computer. They warned, Everyone who purchased this product should not perform any acts such as browsing, copying, executing, or installing the contents of the game disc and bonus disc of this product on a personal computer. Please stop using this product except on Dreamcast. CoolKiz apologized for the mishap and promised to increase efforts on quality assurance moving forward. Natasha Staley, a technology consultant for antivirus firm Sophos at the time, said it was likely that the virus ended up on the CD due to a developer working from an infected machine at their studio. With the Chris virus being over a year old at the time, she suggested that quality assurance wasn't up to much. The game was recalled from stores and later reissued, with the screensavers being published online, virus-free, at a later date. It seems Sega's misfortunes came thick and fast during the era of the Dreamcast. While working on Metropolis Street Racer, the team recorded the game's car sound effects by renting a Mercedes SLK and hooking it up with microphones. The team took the car out onto a test track, shifting the car into various gears and recording the resulting noise. That was until, unexpectedly, the car's engine blew. The car was towed to a country lane nearby, and a breakdown service was called in to repair the damage. The engine was fixed, and the car was returned to the hire company. Unsurprisingly, however, the hire company reviewed the machine's engine management report, and ended up billing Sega for thousands to replace the engine entirely. This wasn't the only unstable part of the game's creation. Multiple delays pushed the game's release back from 1999 to late 2000, also resulting in the game's planned Japanese release to be cancelled entirely. Upon release in Europe, a variety of bugs had been found, and thus Sega issued for the game to be recalled, and replaced with a new version. The reissued European release would ultimately become the version which was distributed within the US. Of course, we couldn't talk about Dreamcast games without mentioning the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. We've mentioned various changes between Sonic Adventure's final release and its beta because of development starting on the Sega Saturn. Check out that video if you're curious. But there's actually several other changes made during development. The Windy Valley area went through dramatic redesigns between the release of the Sonic Adventure Auto Demo and its final release. The area was originally planned to be largely covered on foot, with wider open fields. The final version, however, has the player traverse more narrow, winding pathways. A number of textures in the level also differ. While the tornado did still make an appearance and sweep Sonic away, it is a completely different shape and color. It's speculated that the level was overhauled because its design didn't line up with the rest of the game. Members of SonicHacking.org have been working on properly restoring the original prototype of the area for Sonic Adventure DX as faithfully as possible. YouTuber Blaze Hedgehog has uploaded a complete playthrough of the project in 4K if you're interested in seeing the level in its entirety. Another element featured in the game's auto demo was Knuckles' uppercut attack. The attack appears to be similar to the punch attack featured in the final game. However, this flurry of punches ended in a spinning uppercut. Oh, you can 
it is as yet still unknown why this was removed from the game. Another piece of trivia surrounding Knuckles comes from his theme in the game, Unknown from M.E. The track actually incorrectly refers to Knuckles as a porcupine with the line, the new porcupine on the block with the buff chest. Presumably, the mistake was made because porcupine and echidnas are both little mammals covered in quills. The rap is performed by Marlon Saunders, who worked on the soundtracks for several Sega games like Knights Into Dreams, among others. He was also joined by Dread Fox for the Sonic Adventure version of the track, who is also the voice of the rhyming dog Parappa the Rapper. Another Dreamcast title was Mortal Kombat Gold. Releasing exclusively for the system in 1999, the game was planned to showcase a new fighter named Belloc. However, according to series co-creator Ed Boon, Belloc was cut due to developer Eurocom not having enough time to finish him. Although the character was scrapped, screenshots of Belloc were published in Game Informer magazine. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we've decided to talk about Nicktoons Racing, which came out at the turn of the millennium. The credits has a Jeff Badger listed for his work as a morale consultant for the development team. This is a peculiar entry in the game's credits, not just because the role of a morale consultant is not typically a real thing, but also because Jeff Badger doesn't appear to be a real person. A clue behind the meaning of this credit comes from within the game's data itself. Here, an image of a badger wearing a green suit and red tie can be found. This image doesn't appear anywhere within the game. Did you know? Nights into Dreams was first conceived during the production of Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Sonic 2 was developed by Sonic Team in conjunction with Sega Technical Institute, which was located in San Francisco. As a result, the game's lead programmer, Yuji Naka, had to travel back and forth between Japan and America. While he waited for his plane to take off on a return trip to Japan, Naka was struck with the idea of creating a game centered around flight. Sonic's character designer, Naoto Oshima, was enthusiastic about the idea and saw it as a way for Sonic Team to break new ground. That said, Sonic Team were unsure how to design a platform action game where the main character could simply fly over the platforms. Tackling this problem required a trial and error approach, which led to many ideas being rejected. One scrapped idea centered around the protagonist being a little bird that was unable to fly, but would grow and gain the power of flight as the game progressed. The idea was ultimately scrapped, as an animal protagonist could have drawn close comparisons to Sonic. In the end, a humanoid design was chosen to distance this new game from the Sonic series. Sonic Team eventually focused on the idea of a game set in a dream world and wanted to create a world that reflected the experience of dreaming. The team researched dreams and a deep psyche. Takashi Izuka's research was particularly thorough to the point that his colleagues started asking him to analyze their dreams. According to Izuka, Knights represents what is known in Jungian psychology as the shadow. To heavily simplify, the shadow is an aspect of a person's character that they aren't consciously aware of. While this is often a negative aspect that is repressed, it represents unrecognized positive traits as well. Yuji Naka also claimed that the characters Clarice and Elliot were based on Young's theory of anima and animus, an inner feminine personality for men and an inner masculine personality for women. Another interesting point is that Izuka's favourite aspect about Knights was that fans might be able to meet the game's characters for themselves in their own dreams. Sonic Team wanted Knights to feel equally accessible to all players. The character Knights was made genderless so that the player could create their own impression of what gender Knights was. According to Naoto Oshima, Knights themselves was inspired by Peter Pan. Both characters are capable of extraordinary feats that humans could only dream of. Oshima wanted to create juxtaposition with two gameplay styles, one where you play as a regular human and one where you play as Knights to accomplish these feats. Yujinaka has also cited the Cirque du Soleil show Mystère as his biggest source of inspiration when it came to designing Knights. Knights was also designed to appear more European. This was an effort to differentiate it from Sonic the Hedgehog's more American style. The European aspects of Knights are further emphasised in the sequel Journey of Dreams, where the characters are given British accents and live in a city that resembles London. Knights in the Dreams didn't have voice acting in the traditional sense, but some characters talk in an unrecognisable language. This choice was made to reinforce the idea that the game takes place in a dream where language is distorted and alien. This dream language was made by Takashi Izuka and has real world translations. One of the best demonstrations of this takes place when Knights encounters their arch rival Riala, who exclaims, There is no knight! 
According to Yuji Naka, Riala is saying, Come on, knights. Sonic Team didn't have any soundproof recording facilities during production, so dialogue was recorded late at night once everyone had left the offices. The movement of Knights was supposed to feel smooth and graceful, and Sonic Team felt the Saturn's D-pad was too limited to capture the motions of the character. In response to this, Sega developed a new joypad specifically built with Knights in mind, and bundled it with the game upon its release. Dubbed the 3D Control Pad, this new controller featured an analog stick that gave the player full 360 degree control over Knights. The controller also had analog triggers, which were a novelty for home console controllers at the time. At one point, director Steven Spielberg visited visited the Sonic Team studio and was the first person outside of the company to play Nights in the Dreams using the prototype 3D control pad. As an in-joke, Sonic Team christened the pad the Spielberg controller and referred to it as such for the entirety of development. During the holiday season of 1996, Sega released a promotional build of the game titled Christmas Nights into Dreams. This sample included the first level of the retail release which would undergo seasonal reskins depending on the time of year. For example, during Christmas, the characters don Santa outfits, and on April Fool's Day, Nights is replaced by Riala. This was all done according to the Saturn's internal clock. Christmas Nights also included an unlockable karaoke mode, as well as a mode called Sonic the Hedgehog into Dreams. In this mode, the player has the opportunity to run around the game as Sonic. This actually marked the first time that Sonic was playable in a fully 3D environment on home console, predating Sonic Jam by half a year. The Nightopians that can be found in almost every level have their own AI, dubbed Artificial Life, or A-Life, by Sega. The Nightopians' mood, as well as the overall mood of the level, is affected by the player's actions. Breeding and hatching more Nightopians results in the level feeling more upbeat, whereas killing them makes the level more dismal. A-Life would go on to be used as the basis for Chao in the Sonic Adventure titles. The characters from Knights have made numerous cameos and appearances in other Sonic Team developed titles, including both Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2, Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg, Fantasy Star Online, and Phil the Magic XYXX. Knights was also playable in Sonic Riders and its sequel. Knights and Riala even made a brief cameo in the 1997 Australian film Pause. The main character Nathan has a poster of them hanging on his wall. Although Knights wouldn't see a true sequel until 2007's Journey of Dreams, a sequel was planned for the Dreamcast. The project went under the working title Air Knights. During a 2007 interview, Izuka revealed Sega had been experimenting with motion controls on their consoles. Air Knights was a prototype game to test that technology. When nothing came of the idea, development stopped. In a 1999 interview with official Dreamcast magazine, Naka mentioned how fans were very interested in a sequel. This included a certain high-profile game developer. Naka said, I was asked about this by many fans during this year's E3. Even Nintendo's Mr. Miyamoto asked me if I was making it. Did you know? The hardware of the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive outside of North America, was based on a modified version of Sega's System 16 arcade boards. Arcade cabinets that used the System 16 hardware included Altered Beast, Shinobi, Golden Axe, and Alex Kidd, The Lost Stars. Because of the similar hardware, Sega was able to launch the Genesis with a collection of recognizable games that looked and sounded very similar to their arcade counterparts. However, these ports were slightly scaled down. Even though both systems used the same CPU, the arcade boards were clocked at 10 MHz while the Genesis ran at a slower 7.61 MHz. The idea of having popular arcade kits at home helped move Genesis systems at first, but Sega soon found that what works in the arcade doesn't necessarily work in the living room. Gamers in the gaming press complained that early Sega Genesis games were too short and repetitive. This in part prompted the creation of Sega's killer app, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic was also the answer to Sega being able to contend with Mario, but this was just another example in a long line of competitive moves between Sega and Nintendo. Nintendo had the Famicom modem and the Super Famicom Satellaview add-on, so Sega tried their hand at a series of similar devices. One of these devices was the Mega Modem in Japan. It was a device that allowed users to check the news, weather, banking data, and even let them use an optional print 
printer. Sega also released a Sega Network cartridge. This gave users access to the Sega Games Library, a subscription service that allowed owners to download and play games from a menu. Nearly half a dozen titles were available at launch, with more promise in the future. However, due to lackluster sales, the network was taken offline a year later. In Japan, 16 Mega Drive games made use of the Mega modem for online play, although there was considerable lag and it was fairly expensive. Sega of America planned to release the Mega modem in North America under the name the Telegenesis modem, but these plans were cancelled without announcement. A download subscription service eventually made its way to North America late in the Genesis life cycle with a device called the Sega Channel. For $12.95 a month, users could play downloadable games and demos as well as check the news and read gaming tips. Some games were released for the service before they were sold in stores, and a few import titles were placed on the service that were never released in North America, including Mega Man The Wily Wars and Game Freak's Pulse Man. A few years into the Super Nintendo's reign, Nintendo came out with a Super FX chip. This enabled the Super Nintendo to render more advanced 2D and 3D effects. Sega responded to the Super FX chip with their own SVP, or Sega Virtual Play chip. The one Genesis title that used the SVP chip, Virtua Racer, retailed at nearly $100, making it the most expensive Genesis cartridge to ever be sold in stores. Ironically, the price of additional chips was the primary reason Sega publicly criticized Nintendo in a 1994 issue of Game Fan magazine. Nintendo would like you to believe that by adding chips into their cartridges, they will be saving you money. If Donkey Kong Country, priced at $69.99, is any indication of the money they are saving you, it's a good thing that they are a game company and not your banker. There were plans for at least two more games to use the SVP chip, Virtua Fighter and Daytona USA, but they never materialized in regular cartridge form. The SVP chip didn't turn out to be a good investment, so Sega focused their efforts on the 32X add-on instead. Arguably, the most memorable competition between Nintendo and Sega was in marketing. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. Contrary to popular belief, the widely used Genesis marketing buzzword, blast processing, wasn't just a nonsense term made up for the casual audience. The word was based on a trick that programmers discovered that temporarily increased the graphical capabilities of the Genesis. In an interview with Retro Gamer, former Sega of America technical director Scott Bayless stated, There were all kinds of subtleties to the timing and the trick didn't work reliably on all iterations of the hardware, but you could do it and it was cool as heck. So during the run-up to the Western launch of the Mega CD, the PR guys interviewed me about what made the platform interesting from a technical standpoint. And somewhere in there I mentioned the fact that you could blast data to the digital to analog converters. They love the word blast and the next thing I knew, blast processing was born. The term was used in promotions as a short way of boasting the superior processing speed of the Genesis. However, this was just a convenient side detail, as the Super Nintendo outperforms the Genesis in almost every other category. Despite technical inferiority, Sega was able to grow from less than 8% of the North American market prior to the launch of the Genesis to 55% in 1994. This was achieved through a series of savvy and calculated marketing decisions. Nintendo's strategy was to hook gamers while they are children with a steady stream of quality, family-friendly games. Sega Sega saw this as a chance to cater directly to older gamers and teenagers. Sega of America coordinated with a market research firm where they studied the daily lives of around 100 teenagers. They spent months analyzing every aspect of their lives, filming what they said and observing the teens with their friends. The result of this research was a brash and aggressive advertising campaign featuring catchy slogans like Genesis does what Nintendo don't and the famous Sega scream. Sega! This confrontational style of advertisement became the subject of a culture clash between Sega of Japan and Sega of America. Japanese culture tends to favor more subtle advertisement, and it's been reported that the board members of Sega of Japan hated the North American strategy. But Sega president Hayao Nakayama trusted the North American branch, and he gave them permission to do what they felt was right. The results of Sega's marketing not only helped spearhead the Genesis to serious competition for Nintendo in North America, but they also opened the doors for later consoles like the Sony PlayStation to occupy the same market space. In fact, in fact, prior to the release of the PlayStation, a Sony-conducted focus group test found that teenage boys were reluctant to admit whether or not they owned a Super Nintendo. Sega's aim at an older audience in North America made an enormous impact on gaming. In the mid-90s, a series of court hearings in the United States were held after parents and politicians discovered children were potentially exposed to violence and sexual themes. The Genesis port of Mortal Kombat and the Sega CD game Night Trap were at the center of these hearings. The lawsuits prompted Sega of America to create their own rating system to help guide parents and children on the content within their games. Sega introduced the Video Game Ratings Council in 1993, which categorized games with three different ratings. Sega's Video Game Ratings Council was replaced by the industry standard ESRB, or Entertainment Software Ratings Board, after the hearings in April 1994. 
The reaction to Sega of America's attempt at broadening the demographics of video game consumers reverberated all over the world in the decades that followed. Other regulatory agencies were formed and followed the mold set by the ESRB, including PEGI, Pan-European Game Information, and Japan Zero, the Computer Entertainment Ratings Organization. These ratings boards command a lot of power over the content within video games today, meaning the Genesis really lived up to its namesake as a new beginning in gaming. Hi, I'm Nostalgia Nerd, and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at Sega's contribution to the third generation of console gaming, kicked off by the golden age of arcades, the Master System. The home console market had taken a hard hit after the crash of 83, which saw the gaming sphere oversaturated with consoles and truly terrible third-party software. Despite the crash, the life and soul of gaming was still very much alive in bowling alleys and shopping malls. Arcade cabinets housed enough power to outstrip anything bought on store shelves, and offered experimental titles with superior design. It's no surprise that companies looking to sell home consoles would turn their attention to porting and emulating the games that kept players, pocket change in hand, coming back for more. Japan quickly became gaming's market leader, most notably due to the overwhelming popularity of the NES, which offered highly polished titles produced in-house. However, as far as Europe and South America were concerned, it was Sega's master system that ruled supreme. The system's library featured ports of Sega's more popular arcade titles, such as Golden Axe and OutRun, as well as of high-quality games that came built into the system's BIOS, including Hang On, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Alex Kidd in Miracle World. The console also had some incredibly rare and obscure titles, such as a Game to Check Kotsu Anzen, which may have had fewer than 1,000 copies printed. Co-developed by Sega and insurance company Marine Tokyo, the game's title can be roughly translated to Check the Game Traffic Safety. It consists of three mini-games aiming to promote road awareness, an interactive hazard perception video, much like modern-day theory tests, a six-minute driving simulation, where players can lose points for failing to follow traffic laws, and demonstrations on safe usage of pedestrian crossings. This last one in particular is aimed at children, with parents and teachers encouraged to watch and assist. Edutainment games were growing in popularity as technology found its way into classrooms, and developers focused on the gamification of problem solving in an emerging new genre. This alone is partially responsible for Game to Check's rarity. The game was never meant to be sold commercially, and was only available on loan for schools and residents associations that wanted it. Tokyo Marine outlined plans to keep a master system with Game to Check already built into the console at each branch of the company in Japan totaling 1,000 units. However, whether this loan service was ever put into action remains unknown. A Japanese newspaper article published in 1988 was the only evidence the game even existed until January 2010, when a single copy went up for auction by a private collector. Despite the listing featuring only photos of the cartridge, with no in-game screenshots provided, the auction closed at an offer of 800,000 yen, approximately 9,000 US dollars. This large figure was actually something of a bargain, as the seller had listed their ideal price at 3 million yen, or $32,000. There is very little else known about Game to Check, other than what this elusive private collector has relayed to us, that the game is surrealist, but nonetheless good-looking and well-made. And since the auction's closure, there has been no new information divulged by its new owner. Some unreleased Master System titles never even made it to cartridge to begin with, like Lemmings 2 The Tribes. The original Lemmings began life on the Amiga, but its status as a third-party title meant it had no console loyalty, and was rapidly ported to just about every platform in existence. So it came as no surprise to fans that developer DMA Design would do the same with the sequel in 1993. However, it wasn't until 2006 that programmer Matt Taylor revealed that a Master System and Game Gear port had not only been in the works, but had actually been completed. Publisher Psygnosis cut the release short, deeming it no longer commercially viable to invest in Sega's 8-bit platforms. They were considered just too old to expect profitable returns, and these fears were exacerbated by the high cost of cartridge production in Europe. In fact, the only 8-bit platform release that Lemmings 2 saw was on the Game Boy, which was incredibly successful and still relevant at the time. 
Matt Taylor disagreed with the decision, and in his opinion the Game Gear port was the superior version above all others. He believed the game put the so-called outdated 8-bit consoles through their paces, pushing them to the limit and demonstrating just how much they could do. Taylor eventually released the ROMs of the Master System and Game Gear versions of Lemmings 2 in 2014, giving retro enthusiasts a new game to play on their platform of choice over 20 years after its release. We've talked a little about how the arcades shaped the Master System, but to get into some of the wider iterations of the console, we have to go a little further back, to the year 1945 to be precise, right after the end of the Japanese occupation of Korea. Tensions in the region culminated in South Korea enacting a law to restrict the distribution of media, primarily of Japanese origin. As a result, Sega couldn't publish their gaming products in Korea. In a bid to sidestep the embargo, Sega approached Samsung, a Korean company, to manufacture and distribute the Master System on their behalf to avoid causing any upset. This also necessitated a name change, and so the Master System was introduced to the Korean market as the Game Boy. Nintendo also struck up a similar agreement with Hyundai for the distribution of the NES, renamed the Comboy. These clone versions were of a far higher quality than the cheap knockoffs manufactured by many third-party companies, remaining almost identical to the real thing besides the obvious rebranding. The only significant difference between the Japanese and Korean versions of the Master System is its controller design. Its curved edges set it apart, and the cross-shaped D-pad is particularly striking considering this feature had already been patent protected by Nintendo. While there were several Master System exclusives released in Korea, the relaxed copyright laws encouraged piracy and the distribution of unlicensed products. This resulted in a games library resembling something of a Wild West, with a mishmash of Korean, Japanese and English ports and translations. The agreement between Sega and Samsung would extend to the distribution of the Mega Drive and Saturn in later years, including a re-release of the Game Boy as the Aladdin Boy, possibly in a bid to align it with Samsung's Aladdin PC line. Eventually, Samsung would duck out of the console race after poor sales of the Saturn, with only 2,000 units sold in its first month. This is unsurprising considering its 550,000 won price tag, roughly $460 making it the most expensive console on the Korean market at the time. In contrast, the Game Boy sold incredibly well, moving an estimated 130,000 units in 1989. The South Korean ban on Japanese cultural imports would only begin to relax in 1998 with the allowance of manga, lifting further again in 2004 to include films, music and indeed video games. As the rest of the world moved on to newer consoles, the Master System's lifespan in Brazil extended long after its decline everywhere else, and brand new titles were even ported over from the Game Gear, Sega's direct competitor to Nintendo's Game Boy. One such title was Sonic Blast. While the name may imply some kind of connection to the Mega Drive and Saturn's Sonic 3D Blast, the only thing the two games have in common is Sonic & Co. Sonic Blast was otherwise known as G-Sonic, the last first-party title released for the Game Gear in Japan. While the Master System's higher screen resolution allowed players to see more of the environment than they could on a handheld screen, the ports came with a raft of issues. High visual detail was sacrificed in order to accommodate the Master System's smaller palette, leading to a compression of colour that's not easy on the eyes. There were also very few changes that accounted for the increase in screen size beyond a few borders in menus and loading screens. This meant gameplay was frequently afflicted by graphical artefacts and screen flickering. To top it off, the game is impossible to run on earlier Master System models due to its 1MB cartridge size, which is enormous compared to games made back in the Master System's heyday. While Sonic Blast is critically panned by retro enthusiasts and is seen as a disappointing end to the Game Gear's cycle, the Master System port's existence is just one of many that prove the Brazilian market was strong enough for Tectoy to put any time or money into developing it in the first place. In fact, the console is still being produced in Brazil today. After multiple re-releases, its current iteration looks a little different than the original, with Tectoy having done away with a cartridge slot in the noughties. Today, Brazilian consumers can pick up a Master System complete with 132 games built in for 149 real, which works out to about $40, making it by far the cheapest console available in the country. While gaming interest in Brazil has not shifted to PC, the Master System continues to sell approximately 150,000 units a year, not bad for a console in its mid-30s. 
The Master System's extensive library unsurprisingly also includes an extensive selection of Easter eggs. Within Sega's Fantasy Star, hidden items called M-System and Zillion were uncovered by players, clearly references to the Master System, as well as Zillion, another first-party title developed for the console. Neither of these items can be used or sold, given that they can only be added to the player inventory via cheats or hacking. The arcade version of Space Harrier required the player to enter a specific button sequence at the beginning of a stage, before the stage name left the screen. If entered correctly, a hidden development credit is displayed for programmer Yu Suzuki, and signed November 1985. Space Harrier's release on the Master System went a step further, with a hidden message that appears only after the player fills all seven high score entries with ERI accessed by scoring over a million points in seven playthroughs without turning the console off. A message appears for about 50 seconds before returning to the game's title screen and reads, Wonderful fantastic you, smart guy. Please send us your thoughts to this game. We'll answer a letter with something to the first 10 persons. So forgive us, if your letter is out of 10, we can't reply to yours. By the way, can you see why you can find this message? followed by Sega's Tokyo Address. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Namco's Tekken Tag Tournament, which originally released exclusively for the PlayStation 2, besides the arcades, that is. According to the game's producer, Katsuhiro Harada, Sega tried to swoo Namco out of this exclusivity, however. Sega told Namco that if they were willing to port Tekken Tag Tournament to the Dreamcast, they'd give Namco the right to put a Virtua Fighter character of their choice into the game for free. Namco declined their offer. Hello and welcome to the 5th Annual PGA Tour Golf Tournament. That's the Patreon Golf Association for the Uninitiated. That's right Derek, you're joining us on the 69th hole of the Three Master Gamers Cup. First of all, we should thank our sponsors, Ymoop, Queen Maps, Baited and Pencil Sharpeners. Cause you know what they say Tom, a sharp pencil in the hand is a Robert Cox in the pocket. It's a beautiful day here on the Marcavio course, and we have the absolute pleasure of watching Chad Barn and Clefairy Corey Nelson and Gary CXJK stroke the ball. That's a lot of C's, Tom. It sure is, Derek. Yesterday we saw Arkady Skywalker trounce the competition with an easy eagle using his signature Genesol 7 clubs. A tough day for Jackie H and Everett Lafrop though, who both equally saw an error 1355 and just couldn't get out of the rough. Sounds like they had a fair way to go to winning that tournament and wearing the awesome jacket dude. Last year of course your boy Beowulf won the legendary garment just trumping Trevor Wooten. Later on in our coverage, we'll be joined by Vitas Varnas for his thoughts on the proceedings, but for now, I guess we'll watch Guillermo Chavez swing that fucking club around. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for Joshua Buck. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this episode, we'll be exploring trivia for games released on Sega's penultimate console, the Saturn. Things initially seemed set for Sega in their race to dominate the video game console market. They already ran one of the most successful arcade machine manufacturing businesses, and had previously made a home console with extensive third-party support, resulting in the overwhelmingly popular Mega Drive, or Genesis for the Americans. It seemed like all Sega had to do was just keep on the same track, but little did they know, a third player was set to join the race, Sony. Feeling the threat of the PlayStation's superior graphical capabilities, Sega couldn't think of a better solution to improve their chances of success than to simply stick in another graphics processing chip into their next-gen console. However, this could also be the exact reason why Sega failed so miserably. As a result of this additional graphics card, the Saturn became notoriously difficult to develop for. The system rendered geometry using quadrilaterals, while Sony and Nintendo opted to have their system render 3D using triangles. This led to many Saturn games using a workaround of rendering square-shaped geometry, but simply setting one side's length to zero. While this meant that shapes were capable of being less boxy on the system, it did result in issues of textures being warped or distorted. Another issue the system faced was transparency, with developers often opting to use a checkered dithering effect instead of having anything semi-transparent. Although with the reality of the television sets of the period, blurring would diminish this checkerboard effect, making it look closer to transparency than it would appear on a modern display. One game that suffered as a result of the console's limitations was the widely ported id Software title Doom. While there was the issue of monsters appearing semi-transparent in most versions of the game now being turned into some kind of chaotic checkers board, many other issues with the port could have actually been fixed, but it was the choice of John Carmack to not fix them. 
Jim Bagley, a coder who worked on the port, managed to achieve decent results on the game using the Saturn's 3D hardware, but since Carmack wasn't a fan of the effects this rendering style had on the game's visuals, he argued to have the feature removed. Because of this, the game had to run almost entirely on the system's CPU, resulting in a significant reduction in both the game's resolution and the frame rate. Carmack has publicly stated that he regrets this decision, and that in hindsight, he should have been more open to experimentation. The first Sonic the Hedgehog game for the Saturn, Sonic 3D Blast, was simply a port of the already created Sonic 3D released on the Genesis. That said, the port clearly had some extra care and effort put in, as there are some differences, like all new weather effects, redrawn graphics to increase detail and colour depth, as well as new animations to the game's scenery. The special stage was also entirely replaced, with the Saturn using a fully 3D half-pipe minigame inspired by Sonic the Hedgehog 2's bonus stage. What's pretty amazing about the Saturn version, however, is that this edition only took two months to port across. The reason for Sonic 3D's existence on the Saturn is also due to the cancellation of another Sonic title that was being created, Sonic Extreme, which we've covered previously on the channel. Sega wanted to make sure a new Sonic title was available for the Saturn in time for the holiday season. Sonic 3D Blast wasn't the only well-received port on the system. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is perhaps one of the most highly praised games in the series, cementing the Metroidvania genre in the hearts of gamers worldwide. The game was initially released on the PlayStation, and of course the Saturn, although exclusively to Japan. Since then it's been ported to a huge array of platforms, but the Saturn version includes a number of extra areas and features unavailable in the PlayStation game. Most infamously, the Saturn version has the Underground Garden, the entrance of which can actually be seen in the PlayStation version, though it is inaccessible. The player can glitch the PS1 version into allowing access to this area, but it's unfinished, and only a glitched out save point is available. One reason many Saturn players actually bought the console was to get arcade quality graphics in their living room, with titles like Virtua Fighter, a series that just so happens to have quite a few interesting easter eggs and references. For instance, the character Lao Chan, who debuted in the original Virtua Fighter, was actually inspired by Mercenary Tao, also known as Tao Pai Pai, from the original Dragon Ball manga and anime. Lao was even once named Tao Chan, likely a combination of Tao Pai Pai and Jackie Chan. This connection also extends to Lao Chan's daughter, Pai Chan. Virtua Fighter's Jackie Bryant is also likely based on Trunks' Super Saiyan form from Dragon Ball Z. We say this because the game's designer, Seiichi Ishii, once stated in an interview that Jackie was inspired by a Super Saiyan from Dragon Ball, and out of all the Saiyans that could achieve this form, Jackie best lines up with Trunks. Another arcade title that graced the Saturn was The House of the Dead, notable at the time for being a game aimed at an adult audience. According to an interview in the May 1997 edition of Japan's Sega Saturn magazine, House of the Dead's director Takashi Oda specifically wanted the game to target adult gamers. To do this, the team made sure no children or teens appeared in the game so that they wouldn't have to tone the violence down. Oda said, I did that because our target audience was adults and up. From the start of the project we knew we didn't want children playing this game. Had we wanted to target them, I think we would have made the game more about ghosts or something, not zombies. Those considerations are one of the tougher parts of this development. Interestingly, the game was also one of the early pioneers of motion capture. Around half the animations in the game came from motion captured actors pretending to be zombies, but the animations ended up looking a bit too human, and the team had to manually tweak them a bit to be more exaggerated and zombie-like. While some Saturn games were cancelled altogether, other games simply had content that was locked between regions. Power Slave, a first-person shooter developed by Lobotomy Software, contained an easter egg exclusive to the Sega Saturn port, a mini-game called Death Tank. To unlock the secret game, the player must collect all of the hidden team dolls found throughout Power Slave. This multiplayer title was inspired by Scorched Earth, though shifted gameplay from turn-based to real-time. It was created as a hobby project on the side by Ezra Dreisbach, who put it together in his spare time. Both he and Lobotomy Software co-founder Brian McNeely had an ongoing rivalry over the game, playing it every day religiously. Rather impressively, the game actually supported up to seven players through the use of the Sega Saturn multi-tap. However, the mini-game wasn't available within PAL versions of Power Slave, known as Exhumed, as it was released before the NTSC version and before Death Tank had been completed. That said, the game would go on to have more life after this, with an updated version titled Death Tank Zwei appearing exclusively within another port of a title released on the system, Duke Nukem 3D. To unlock the next entry to this easter egg minigame, the player must either have a Quake or Exhumed save game file on their system, 
or destroy every toilet found through Duke's journey. Some may know Death Tank for its later release, however, as the game proved so popular among players and the staff that a standalone version was developed and released for the Xbox Live Arcade on the Xbox 360 in 2009. This release even included, as seems traditional, its own easter egg, the inclusion of a version of Death Tank's Vi, which is unlocked by shooting down a supply plane in the main game. Anyone familiar with Sega will tell you the company's history is a rocky one. It was among the biggest hardware developers to come out of Japan in the 1990s, but when consoles turned to disc-based technology, their sales began to falter. Sega's final attempt at a home console was the Sega Dreamcast, a system that still holds a cult following to this day. One of the last games developed by Sega for the device was a love letter to fans filled with the characters and charm that Sega was known for. They called it Sega Gaga. Released in March 2001, Sega Gaga is a bizarre RPG that referenced not only the company itself, but also a large number of Sega's games and characters. The name is a play on the term being Gaga for something, and in particular, being Gaga for Sega. It was chosen in place of the name Sega Sega, as they hoped that reducing the focus on the Sega name would be less intrusive. Often abbreviated to SGGG, the title was directed by Tez Okano, who would later go on to create Gunstar Superheroes and Astro Boy Omega Factor. Although the game was primarily an RPG, it covers a mixture of genres. It defines itself as a Sega simulator, with the game's plot and story loosely based on the reality of what happened to Sega. In the game's story, Sega is struggling financially against its leading competitor, Dogma. Sega's world marketplace share is a mere 3%, and without any signs of improvement. To fix this, the company plans to get kids from the street and introduce them to the company in the hopes that their management can bring the company back to its former glory. The player takes on the role of one of those kids. Taro Sega. During the initial part of the game, the player is tasked with battling employees from various development studios within the company. This stage of the game talks about how the giant doors of the building are there to keep the employees in rather than keeping everybody else out. The high stress levels of developing games has caused them to become subhuman, something that the game proclaims is the unfortunate truth of the game's industry. Nobody has entered the development room in 20 years, and so none of the company's higher-ups really know what is happening at Sega. Sometimes they receive a finished product in exchange for food and water, but eventually somebody has to go in and crack the whip. This initial part of the game plays out like a standard RPG, with each studio being a maze filled with a variety of enemies. Some playful enemy designs are thrown into the mix, ranging from literal cut-out photographs of real developers within Sega, bizarre creatures and various mecha forms of Ralph Macchio, the actor for Daniel LaRusso in The Karate Kid. Unlike typical RPGs, battles don't unfold by exchanging physical attacks. Instead, the fight is an exchange of verbal abuse by commanding your enemy and insulting them. Telling them that they will never have a girlfriend or that their product can't make any money, you will eventually weaken their will and defeat them. With only a single party member and enemy in battle at a time, this is a fairly simple process. There are a number of special attacks that can be used, however, with interesting and unique results. The consequences of failing to defeat an opponent doesn't result in a game over, but instead removes a month of development time from the company, something that is extremely detrimental for the latter part of the game. After taking down an enemy, it's possible that they will want to join you on your quest and will try to negotiate for a job. This is performed through a 10 second segment of exchanging questions in quick succession, including what sort of salary they can expect to receive. After the process of hiring, the game moves into its advertised simulation segment. Each studio brought on board is made up of seven members, three programmers, three designers, and a director. These employees make up the total stats for a studio, providing them with stamina, creativity, skill, and speed. This leaves the player with a number of decisions, such as whether they want to create a skilled team to produce a few high-quality products, or just push out fast shovelware in a hope that it will increase profits. There are a total of four studios that can be taken on board. After three years with the company, the game ends, and different endings can be achieved depending on how well you performed. The only way to fail the game entirely is by running out of funds before the three years are over. Dialogue between characters shows the real 
life dilemmas that face game developers. The hero wants to create innovative and fresh titles that will attract new customers and help the company thrive. But many will say how such things are hard to achieve and the company's financial security is more important. The game's most well-received element is its homage to Sega's past. With constant cameo appearances, retro music, references to other Sega games, and even bizarre mini-games that throw back to previous Sega titles, there is a huge amount of fan service for Sega veterans. While we doubt many of you will ever get the chance to play Sega Gaga, we're giving you a warning that this next part of the video details the ending of the game. So if you don't want it to be spoiled, skip to the time displayed on screen. In the game's climax, the player straps himself into an R720 unit, a parody of the Sega R360 arcade unit, which results in him being shot into space. With the evil Dogma Corporation performing a hostile takeover, a huge cast of Sega characters are sent out to battle them. This includes characters like Sonic, Tails, Rystar, a variety of Fantasy Star characters, and the Bad Brothers from the first stage of Golden Axe. The player is pitted against a barrage of enemies in a shoot 'em up style game. The boss of this stage is a continually upgrading piece of Sega hardware, which after each form is destroyed, will morph into the next console generation. This segment is similar to Thunder Force, particularly with the inclusion of an additional vessel reminiscent of the ship's design in Thunder Force 5. Sega Gaga's director, Tez Okano, would later go on to work on the Thunder Force sequel, Thunder Force 6, which launched on the PlayStation 2. This game was originally in development for the Sega Dreamcast, however, and some of the original assets are used in this final scene. When Okano initially pitched the title to Sega's management, many believed his proposal to be a joke. After a second round of fund seeking for the project, it was approved by Hisao Oguchi, the president of the now defunct Sega development team Hitmaker. Okano estimated the total budget for the game to be less than a hundredth of Shenmue, which is known for being a huge financial burden on Sega with a budget of over $70 million. One factor that helped the game's reduced production cost came from Toei Animation, who gave a discount to the developers on all animated footage. Sega Gaga released at a time when the Dreamcast future was bleak. Sega's schedule for upcoming high-quality releases was looking sparse, and they needed to do something that would bring in revenue. Just two months before the game was released, Sega announced the discontinuation of the Dreamcast. At this stage, Sega Gaga had been in development for two years in secret. Okano was concerned that after development was revealed, anything can happen. This is an important point, as one of the reasons the game was published was because Sega was struggling financially, and they felt that the company wouldn't be portrayed in a negative light within the game. When Sega Gaga was initially conceived, there were around 300 copyright issues that needed to be resolved within the company. This was later brought down to just 100, meaning some of the game's ideas had to be scrapped or changed. These include the idea of having Sega's famous Sega Saturn mascot in the game, Sega Ta Sanshiro, as well as a Ferrari. The franchises that ended up appearing in the game came as a result of their popularity with fans, as well as the availability from a legal perspective. After the game launched, Okano stated that he was given a marketing budget of around $200. Okano spent over half the budget on a wrestling mask in order to hide his identity during signing events he set up at four locations across Akihabara, with support from the head of Sega's PR, Tarashi Takazaki, and Taku Sasahara from Sega AM3, the game was able to obtain a full-page newspaper article, which helped to increase awareness and popularity for the title. The game launched with respectable sales through Sega's online store, ultimately leading to a full retail release. It's not surprising that the game was never localized, as the target audience was extremely limited even within Japan, never mind the rest of the world. The Dreamcast, which had already been discontinued at the time of the game's launch, and Sega's lack of financial stability are both likely contributing factors to the lack of translation. The game also makes heavy use of text, and has a huge volume of characters and cultural elements that simply don't translate well for a Western market. 
Reworking all of these elements into a narrative that makes sense to Westerners would be time consuming and expensive. Not only this, but the previously mentioned licensing issues would need to be renegotiated all over again for different markets. Efforts were once made by a group of fans to translate the game, but with no news coming out for almost four years at the time of this video, it's unknown whether the game will ever be playable in English. Hello and welcome to Region Locked. The Sega Saturn was definitely not the big hit that Sega was hoping for. One of the console's biggest competitors, Sony's PlayStation, dominated the console market while Sega trailed behind with a significant disparity between sales. One genre which saw increasing popularity during the era of the Saturn and PlayStation were more adult-oriented survival horror titles, such as Resident Evil. One of the last games to be published on the Sega Saturn in Europe tried to replicate this interest, developed by Sega themselves. Deep Fear. Deep Fear was published for the Saturn in 1998 in both Japan and Europe. The title is extremely reminiscent of Capcom's Resident Evil, though instead of being based within a zombie-riddled mansion, the story takes place in an underwater facility. The facility, SSB-01, otherwise known as The Big Table, is a naval refueling base and research lab located 300 metres below the Pacific Ocean. Because of cuts to the US Navy budget, space aboard the facility has been rented out to a variety of companies. These include a medical manufacturer called Medical Industry, a telecommunications company called Dynamic Network, and an agricultural company called Sea Farm. Space was also provided to the Emergency Rescue Services, or ERS. This organization is civilian operated and aims to assist in civilian related rescue operations. The player takes on the role of John Mayer, a member of the ERS and an ex Navy SEAL, who operates out of the big table as security personnel. A capsule has fallen from space and landed close to the facility's location, containing a chimpanzee that had been launched into space 40 years prior. The launch was part of an experiment to determine the effects of cosmic radiation on living beings, which has mutated the chimpanzee, slowing its metabolism and causing it to enter a state of hibernation. The crew attempt to examine the effects of the chimp's isolation in space to find ways of replicating the same result, allowing for humans to successfully adopt deep space travel. A nearby submarine, the Sea Fox, has recovered the pod and is dispatched to refuel at the big table, and to receive help with the investigation of the contents. But, unsurprisingly, things don't go to plan, and the Sea Fox crashes into the Navy area of the Big Table, which houses a secret research facility with a high security clearance level. A team of Navy SEALs are tasked as the primary rescue force, while the ERS are tasked with extracting a VIP doctor on board. To make matters worse, a mutation has begun to spread across the facility, transforming the humans that inhabit it, both alive and dead, into violent, monstrous creatures as a result of cosmically irradiated bacteria. Adding to this, the resident agricultural company Sea Farm specialises in breeding surface-dwelling animals, and now these other creatures are mutated and are causing havoc on the base. The mutation's weakness is exposure to high levels of oxygen, and thus the monsters work to destroy the Big Table's oxygen generators. John Mayer may be sick with a cold, but he's seemingly unaffected by the spread of the mutation, and works to escape from the Big Table and rescue those trapped within. Environments within Deep Fear are similar to Resident Evil, in that they use a fixed camera angle and pre-rendered backdrops. As the game takes place underwater, with a limited and dwindling oxygen supply, one of the necessary elements of survival is the air itself. The player must refill areas with oxygen to make them habitable again. The oxygen can be replenished a number of ways, including oxygen grenades, finding yellow boxes known as air systems, and if neither are available, the player can use an air regulator which can be replenished. However, as the facility is also occupied by mutants, the use of firearms is a necessity, something that does not lend itself to oxygen conservation, as firing a gun can deplete oxygen levels quickly. Much like Resident Evil, the player must first draw their weapon with one button and fire it with another. Unlike Resident Evil, however, the player can still move while their weapon is drawn, and can make use of a lock-on button to help target enemies. The player is also able to switch between locked-on targets. As the Big Table contains a Navy operations base, there is a large supply of weapons and ammunition available, though they are found within weapon storage locations. As security clearance is still in operation on the vessel, only some members of the crew are able to gain access to these facilities through keycards. The game's environments, both the Big Table and the Sea Fox, are also changeable. Oxygen supply is just one of the varieties of issues that must be dealt with, along with flooded locations and a map which is altered as the game progresses. Throughout the game, in true survival horror fashion, a variety of puzzles must also be solved. 
Similar to Resident Evil, various text-based articles can also be discovered and read, providing deeper lore to the game's story. One interesting aspect of Deep Fear is its control scheme. While most of the audience for the game would have played using the standard tank-like controls from Resident Evil, turning with left and right while moving with up, the game did also support the 3D controller. This was an optional controller released for the Sega Saturn, debuting with Nights into Dreams, which features an analog stick, and for the first time for mainstream controllers, analog triggers. When this controller is being used, the game controls very differently, with the player moving in the direction of the analog stick instantly, rather than turning. This control scheme wouldn't make its appearance in Resident Evil until several years after Deep Fear's debut. Several members of the team behind Deep Fear are well known, including late manga artist Yasushi Nirasawa, who designed the various malformed mutations, and is best known for his work with the Kamen Rider series. Coincidentally, Deep Fear's Japanese advertisement stars the Saturn's mascot Sagata Sanshiro, played by Hiroshi Fujioka, who was also known for his role as Takeshi Hongo, the first Kamen Rider. Shared names seem to be a common theme with Deep Fear, as the in-game company Shirahata Corporation shares its name with the game's co-director, Kunihiro Shirahata. The Sea Fox, the submarine that crashes into the big table, could also be a potential reference to earlier Sega titles Tails Adventure and Sonic Triple Trouble, which also features a submarine of the same name. The chimp which was recovered from the capsule was also very likely based upon the real-life chimpanzees which had been launched into space for NASA's Mercury project in 1961, Ham and Enos. Though unlike Deep Fear, both chimps landed safely back on Earth. One of Deep Fear's most recognisable downfalls comes in the game's voice acting. Similar to Resident Evil, the game has English dubbing in both PAL and Japan territories, and is of notoriously poor quality. One of the most bizarre character voices comes from Dubois, portrayed by Winston Kirk. This is terrible! My masterpiece is ruined! Oh, what am I gonna do? Yeah. In a similar fashion to many games in Japan, Deep Fear received an audio drama adaptation released in two parts called Deep Fear Sound Drama Volumes 1 and 2, including both opening and closing songs with lyrics. Yuzo Sugano, who acted as the screenwriter for Deep Fear, would later go on to write and direct the 2001 survival horror title Extermination. Gabe Riley, a lieutenant in Deep Fear, shares the same surname as the main protagonist of Extermination, Dennis Riley. Extermination was originally pitched as a sequel to Deep Fear by developers Deep Space, who had started creating the game as a Dreamcast title in 1998. Their first pitch for the game was turned down by Sega as not only did Deep Space pose a huge risk as an unknown developer at the time, but the game's story, content and gameplay had major contrasts to Deep Fear. Many of the staff members from Deep Fear would go on to work on Extermination, including screenwriter Yuzo Sagano, as well as background designer Moriyoshi Ohara, and 2D CG designer and planner Teku Kobayashi as the game designer. Deep Fear is very much geared towards a Western audience. While there is no official retail release of Deep Fear in the US, the intention was at least investigated in some small part. A US encoded version of the game has been circulated on the internet for a while, and auctions can be found for discs containing unreleased US builds of the game. An unlicensed Saturn release, known as Lost and Found Volume 3, created by Older Games in 2007, includes this unreleased US version of the title, though as this disc is entirely unlicensed by Sega, it cannot be deemed as an official US release. Reading into the data of the US prototype, the game's internal date is the 15th of July, two days after the 13th given on the PAL version. The only real difference between both versions is that the US NTSC release is optimised for 60Hz, rather than PAL's 50Hz. Deep Fear holds the recognition of being the last ever published title for the Sega Saturn within PAL territories, providing a strong indication as to why Sega refrained from taking the title to US shores. As the console was nearing the end of its life cycle with poor sales, the cost of publishing the game would have been unlikely to recoup printing costs and do nothing to help increase sales of the dying console. The Sega Dreamcast was set to launch just a few months after Deep Fear's release, so much of Sega's focus had already shifted to promoting their new entry into the console market. Deep Fear is something of an oddity, remembered more for its appalling voice acting than its gameplay. People seem to respond more to the zombie-riddled house setting of Resident Evil, rather than Deep Fear's underwater space chimp. Hello, and welcome to Region Locked.
Ryu Hayabusa has appeared in many games over the years, originally taking on the lead role in Tecmo's Ninja Gaiden series, he would later appear as a playable fighter in the Dead or Alive games. Many gamers know of Ryu's origins in the hugely popular NES Ninja Gaiden game, a staple of Nintendo's 8-bit library, but in PAL territories, Ninja Gaiden was also a Sega Master System game, and this version of the game has several key differences from the popular Nintendo release. Let's take a look at the game and how it came to be. The Sega game plays similarly to the Nintendo version, taking on many elements that helped the original release become a success. The game is all about fast-paced action platforming, with Ryu able to slice at enemies with his sword, jump large distances, and cast special alternate attacks that he picks up along the way. The differences in these two versions can be found in how the player traverses each stage. The ability to cling to walls, which was featured prominently in the original Nintendo release, has been removed. Instead, the game only allows the player to wall jump. However, a new skill is introduced that allows players to grab hold of platforms from below and pull themselves up. Although it borrows several gameplay mechanics from the Nintendo game, the title's plot is disconnected from the rest of the Ninja Gaiden series. The story tells of the Ninja Dragon Clan, a group that have protected Japan for generations. Ryu, who is a member of this clan, returns home after being away for some time. Once Ryu returns, he learns that the Dragon Village, which is the clan's home, has been attacked. Ryu finds a single survivor who, with his dying breath, tells Ryu that the sacred Bushido scroll has been stolen it's said that the scroll holds immense power and whomever controls it could control the world. Ryu, the last remaining ninja of the Dragon Clan, makes it his mission to retake the scroll and destroy the evil Shogun of Darkness. Ryu encounters a number of different enemies throughout his journey, and even aims to rescue a geisha as he takes down the evil Shogun. On release, the Master System Ninja Gaiden was very well received. Most gaming magazines gave the title scores of 90% and above, praising its impressive graphics. The game managed to achieve some fairly striking visuals on the already already dated Sega Master System hardware. Ninja Gaiden's release was a curious one. The Sega Master System was first released to the public in 1985, and was a huge flop in the American and Japanese video game markets. However, in PAL territories, the console was a strong contender against the tyrant that was the NES. The Master System's support in the Japanese and American regions began to fade, as sales for the system were lackluster. Sega refrained from publishing Ninja Gaiden outside of the PAL territories, likely because of the discontinuation of the Master System games in those regions. Interestingly, the NES version of Ninja Gaiden was rebranded as Shadow Warriors when it was brought to Europe. It's unknown why the name wasn't used for the Master System version as well. The game wasn't even programmed by Tecmo, who are the Ninja Gaiden series owners. It was instead produced by a Japanese developer known as Sims, a group that, at the time, were owned by Sega. The company later helped to create the 8-bit version of Disney's Aladdin released on the Sega Game Gear and, in Europe only, the Sega Master System. Although PAL territories got their own exclusive Ninja Gaiden with the Master System release, the region missed out on the NES release of Ninja Gaiden 3. The NES version of Ninja Gaiden 3 wasn't available in Europe until 2014, when it was published on the 3DS Virtual Console. The game might not have been brought to Europe due to the NES's subpar sales in the region. Ninja Gaiden had two other releases that never came to America. The original arcade title was ported over to the PC Engine, which was exclusively released in the Japanese market. The gameplay boasted more impressive graphics than the NES release, and included gameplay and difficulty tweaks. The game even has three different language options, Japanese, English, and Mandarin, and the English English translation is actually different from the one used in the original NES version. The port likely never left Japan because of similar reasons to the Master System title, as the PC Engine had a very weak presence outside of the region. The other title the West never saw was Ninja Gaiden X, a mobile phone prequel to the series. This game inherits the gameplay of the original NES games and has Ryu face off against his father. There isn't much to the game besides killing a few enemies. The most interesting detail about this game might be its title. Calling the game Ninja Gaiden X might make sense to us Westerners, but the series was actually called Ninja Ryukenden in Japan. Although the retro games don't have the Ninja Gaiden handle in Japan, the modern games for the Xbox and beyond do. The title Ninja Gaiden X was likely chosen to align the game's branding with the modern reboot. Hello, and welcome to Region Locked. Sega's popular Valkyria series has resonated with a Western audience. This might have something to do with its first title establishing a war-torn world not too different from our own. With added fantasy elements and a unique combat system, it was well received on the PlayStation 3 in 2008. In 2010, a direct sequel was released worldwide for the PSP, which was followed by a third game in 2011, also on the PSP. However, the third title never saw release outside of Japan, so today we'll be taking a look at Valkyria Chronicles 3. 
Valkyria Chronicles 3 kept many of the mechanics of its predecessors, but also made several adjustments to improve the accessibility for newcomers. The Valkyria games feature a combination of both real-time and tactical roleplay elements that come together to form the Blitz system. The player is assigned missions and must then plan out a team of units for the assignment. During battles, the player can select a unit they wish to move from an overview of the map. Moving units will deplete the action gauge, limiting the distance that they can travel. To complete the unit's movement, a single action can be performed. While a unit can be selected and given a command multiple times, this will limit the other units for the player's turn. Using a unit multiple times will provide the player with a smaller amount of action gauge with each consecutive selection. The game has five types of unit, scouts, shock troopers, engineers, lancers, and armored soldiers, with each having tactical benefits over the others. After each mission, the player is able to bolster their squad by spending their money and experience points. A total of nine units can be dispatched on a mission, with many characters having their own unique skills known as potentials. These potentials define the character as a unique soldier within each fight, and can provide both positive and negative effects in battle. However, a unit's battle potentials are skills that can be learned and honed throughout the game, allowing them to grow as a soldier. Some characters also have special abilities that only they are able to perform. The game's plot takes place during the Second European War, paralleling the events of Welkin's squad in the first game of the series. The player follows Kurt Irving, Imke, and Riella Marcellus, who are assigned to Squad 422, known by many as the Nameless. They're what's known as a penal military unit, comprised of deserters of foreign armies and criminals whose names are stricken from records and have no identification besides a number. The unit is ordered by the Gallian military, often tasked to perform the most dangerous missions that are refused by the militia and the army. With the motto, Altaha Abilia, meaning always ready, the team are forever willing to accept a mission against all odds. The team is made up of Soldier 7, Kurt Irving, previously an army officer with hopes of redemption after being falsely accused of treason. Soldier 1, Imke, a Darkson heavy weapons specialist looking for revenge against the Valkyria that destroyed her home. And there's Soldier 13, Riella Marcellus, a young woman unknowingly of Valkyria descent. The squad's major task is to combat against an Imperial unit shrouded in mystery known as the Calamity Raven, primarily consisting of Darkson soldiers. Many of the higher-ups within the Gallian army will send the team on missions that could reflect poorly on Gallia if the mission goes wrong. This is because the squad is off the records, and the higher-ups have plausible deniability if the squad is discovered or commits any collateral damage. This has many effects during the war, leading to successful incursions, but also has some dire consequences for the people within the unit. Many consider the third entry in the Valkyria series to follow a much darker tone. The trilogy's musical composer, Hitoshi Sakimoto, stated that several of his original compositions for the game's theme were rejected. He had to rework the theme roughly seven times and even adjusted individual pieces of it with a synthesizer before bringing it all together again. He wanted the battle theme to give players a sense of a modern battle, and remove any fantasy elements from the scenario by including modern instruments. The instruments would work together to create a tonality, meaning a lack of functional harmony or central tone. This description and style is thematically similar to the Nameless Unit, being made up of many different chaotic members that are hard to define. The team began work on the third iteration in the series as soon as development had concluded on the second. They felt they could refine mechanics that had been developed in Valkyria Chronicles 2 now that they had experience with the PSP. During a Q&A session, producer Shinji Motoyama stated that he doesn't have any preference when it comes to platform, but understands fan desires for a new entry on a home console. However, he concluded, When selecting platform, we have to make careful consideration, and with this, the reality was that we couldn't easily advance on the PS3. However, I want to say one thing. As developers, we absolutely did not want to make a PS3 version that simply reused the materials and engine from Valkyria 1. Takeshi Ozawa, the game's director, also stated that the development staff consider the third entry to be the first sequel in the series. This is due to the difficulties found when transitioning to the PSP hardware from the PS3. The team had to work through a lot of trial and error before finding a comfortable working environment, which they felt affected the quality of the second game. With the third game on the PSP, the team could use the knowledge that they had gained to improve on areas that they felt were substandard. 
Sega's manager of console sales, Hiroshi Seno, confirmed at the end of 2011 that the third Valkyria game would not be receiving an international release. The reason behind this was the unpopularity of the PSP platform in North America and Europe. To be able to justify a translation effort, the second entry in the series would have needed to sell enough copies to justify the costs involved, which it did not. However, an unofficial fan translation began development only a few months after this statement was made. After two years of production, the translation patch was completed and now allows users to play through the extra edition version of the game in English with ease.